As we're getting ready to start, I'd like to just remind the congregation that our offering baskets in the back of the sanctuary, we don't pass the plates during the service, but we do have a basket in the back. So if you have any gifts or tithes or offerings that you'd like to put in the back basket, that's where it is. Uh, a little bit later in the service, the basket will come forward. And if you've got something that you need to put in there, just wave it. Our usher will make sure that it gets to the basket. Um, and also, we do have nursery going throughout the whole morning. So if you've got a young one that starts getting a little restless and wants to go to the nursery, that's fine. It's clearly marked outside uh, the classroom area. There's a, there's a nursery there to, to make use of. Uh, it's so great to gather together on a Sunday morning, on every Sunday morning, uh, and, and especially this Sunday morning, uh, the fourth Sunday of Advent, which also turns into Christmas Eve a little bit later today, where we are really focused on welcoming Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, into the world and into our lives. My name is Jason Hefner. I'm the pastor here at Lighthouse Christ Presbyterian Church, and I love it when we gather together. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad to be here. When God calls us into a relationship with himself, he also calls us into a relationship with each other. We are called to belong to God and to one another. Tonight, when we celebrate the Christ child, we always see the manger. We see Jesus in the center. Everyone's gathered around. We're all connected in Christ. And this is our time to remember those bonds. So thank you for being here this morning. As I said, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Advent means coming. We are preparing for the coming of the Christ. And we are preparing for his coming into our lives all the time by remembering his first coming into the world, his incarnation as a child. We've been moving progressively every Sunday closer and closer to his birth. Every Sunday, we light an additional Advent candle. Our candles are right over there on the side of the stage. And so I'd like to invite our candle lighters this morning to come forward to lead us in our candle lighting and a uh, prayer this morning, they'll be lighting uh, three purple candles and the pink candle, all of our candles this morning. Please stand for the lighting of the Advent wreath. Lighting candles is an Advent tradition. The lighted candles signify the coming of Christ, the light of the world. This morning we light four candles. The candles of hope, peace, joy, and today's candle is love. This candle reminds us that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Today we celebrate God's, God's love and remember that we have been commanded to love others as God loves us. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as we continue our Advent journey, we are reminded that love came down at Christmas love amazing love love divine you love the world enough to send your son and now it is up to us to love others as you loved us remind us that christ is our light and the true source of infinite everlasting pure love amen 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 thank you so much please be seated our scripture lesson today comes from luke chapter 1 Luke begins his gospel with an origin story. We can imagine that Luke, one of the first generation Christians, um, with many other Christians among him, wanted to know how Jesus, the Son of God, was born. What, how, how was it that he came into this world? Now, Luke was a doctor by profession, and so he was very meticulous in his research. He begins his gospel by saying, I looked into everything very carefully. And one of the things that he did is he went to Mary, who was still alive, who lived for many years after Jesus went into heaven, and said, Mother Mary, will you tell us the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth? What happened? Tell me the story. And Mary told him the story. And that's the story that we're going to hear this morning from Luke chapter 1, verse 26. 
Now, it begins with the phrase, in the sixth month. What, what Luke is referring to there is that uh, it was in the sixth month after the uh, angelic visit to, um, uh, sorry, to Mother John the Baptist. Help me out. Um, Elizabeth, thank you. Elizabeth, right? Gabriel visited Elizabeth to say, you'll have a child, John the Baptist, who will prepare the way for the Messiah. Six months later, the angel Gabriel is on another mission, and that's where we're picking up the story this morning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and would be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord our God, as you sent the angel Gabriel to Mary with good news, news that she was to receive Christ into her life, send your word to us that we might receive Christ into our lives. Amen. So during the holiday season, my family likes to watch Well, Christmas movies, and I'm sure that you probably have a a list of Christmas movies that you watch as well. Sometimes I'll kind of stand back from the whole scene of us watching movies and just see us watching movies, and we're all just kind of sitting on the couch, and we're embracing and enjoying that. And it makes me think back to when my girls were little, and we would watch movies just sprawled out on the couch together. And I am the dad of three daughters, so I have seen many, many, many Princess movies. I have seen all of the princess movies. And I was thinking about princess movies in relation to this story. And I'll tell you why. Because there's a trope. There's something that always happens in the princess movie. The princess is there. And then the king comes or a parent comes and says, surprise, you're a princess. And you're going to marry a prince. And you're going to be queen of the land. And this is wonderful good news. And the young princess says, I don't want that. Isn't that what always happens? No, I don't want that. Uh, You can't tell me what to do. I'm not going to step into that script. I'm going to go find my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. And then we get into the drama of the movie. I understand that this speaks to a young audience that developmentally needs to assert itself against authority and societal structures. We need to build our independent identity. I get that. At the same time, I wonder about our spiritual development. Do we get stuck in a position of saying, I don't want that, God, what you're offering me, I don't want that. I want to go my own way. You're offering me the kingdom, you're offering me the king, you're offering me this great future, but no. Spiritually speaking, we want to develop to the point of being able to say, yes. And that's what our lesson's about this morning. It's about saying yes. Here's Mary in the sixth month of her kinswoman Elizabeth's pregnancy, which she does not yet know about. 
And the angel Gabriel is on the move. The angel Gabriel has visited Elizabeth and said, you will give birth to the forerunner of the Messiah, the one sent from God. And now Gabriel is coming to Mary. Gabriel always brings messages to God's people. Important messages. Messages that God is among them and is going to do some new thing. He started with Elizabeth and now he's coming to Mary with news. There's already a plan in process. Okay. And Gabriel comes to Mary and says, I have for you good news. You will conceive a child. And he will be called the son of the most high. He will sit on the throne of his father, David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob. He brings this incredible news. Now, I'm thinking of Luke interviewing with Mary. And he's saying, tell me what happened. And she says, an angel came to visit me. And he might have wanted to ask, was it the daytime or was it the nighttime? Was it inside or outside? Where did it happen? Where were you located? None of that gets recorded. As tantalizing as it would be to know, it doesn't get recorded. Mary's focus and Luke's focus is on what the angel said. Because the angel said so much about the child that was to be born, that everything else kind of faded into the background. But what the angel said stuck. He will be the son of the Most High. He will sit on the throne of his father, David, and rule over the house of Jacob. All of that gets unpacked over time. Son of the Most High means the one who is next to God, the one who is next to the Most High, all of the angels refer to God as the Most High, and they refer to Jesus as the Son of the Most High. All angels are high, but, but Jesus is the Son of the Most High. He is the Most High. And he will sit on the throne of his father, David. He will fulfill that ancient promise given to David that there would always be a throne for God's people. And he will rule over the house of Jacob which is a reference to the 10 lost tribes of the north that were kind of absorbed into Gentile nations. He's saying that the great one will come and rule over Jew and Gentile alike, he will rule over all people. Mary, you're going to have this son. Was that a statement or was that a request? He appeared and said, you will conceive a son, period. It's a leading question. It is a, it is a proposition of a kind. It's, it's, an, it's, it's indicating there's already a plan in place. And now's your moment, Mary. Now's your moment to become part of this plan. And Mary's picking up on that. And so she wants to clarify something. I'm, I'm amazed at her presence of mind with the angel. Here's this probably young man in dazzling white. That's how angels appear in the Gospels, standing before her suddenly with this news, leading her into this plan. And she might have thought, maybe he's referring to a birth that will happen in due time when Joseph and I are married and settled down. But, it, but you know, he's talking like this is happening right now. And so she asks, is this happening right now? How can, I, how can I have a child being a virgin? And the angel says very clearly, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit will cause this pregnancy. Just as the Holy Spirit blew across the fertile soil of the Garden of Eden and made a man from it. So the Spirit of God will blow through your womb, that fertile womb, and create a new Adam, a son of God. It will be a miracle. Side note, have you ever heard people say, Jesus was just a great teacher, he was a great man, but Christians later on got carried away 
and decided he was divine son of God? Not according to Mary, his mother. Not according to Gabriel. Not according to the very beginning. He was always the son of God. And his virgin birth is the anchor of that belief. Mary, this will be a miracle. And so that you will not doubt, your kinswoman Elizabeth is already carrying a child. She who is advanced in years and was barren is with child to give you hope and faith to know that my words too will come true. Big news for young Mary. And then in verse 37 and 38, there's this little space of white paper between him saying, you will have this child, and her replying, and I think in this space, in this space, the miracle happens. Will Mary say yes to that or no to that? For this brief moment between the giving in of the news and her response, the incarnation is on hold. Christmas is a maybe. The birth has not yet been agreed to. Everything is waiting for Mary's response. Will she say yes to that plan or will she say no? If you were Mary, what would you say? Men, I'm asking you to use your imagination a little extra this morning. (laughs) What would you say to God coming into your life? Our lives are full of plans, aren't they? Maybe you're thinking about school right now, and I got to make these tests and these grades or these requirements or these certifications so I can get into this college or into this job, and that's your life. Those are your plans. God wants to come into your life and say, I want to be in the center of your life. Is there room? Maybe you're thinking about your job and all the tasks that you got to do to make life work, and you're trying to provide for your family, and you're trying to do all these things, every Christmas is the news that God wants to come into your life and be at the center. Is there room there? Maybe you've got health concerns. Maybe you've got wellness concerns. Maybe you're worried about children or grandchildren, and there's all these things, and it's like God says, I want to come in. Is there room? Is there room? God wants to be born in our lives, not not in our physical bodies, but in our souls, in our spirits, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we should ponder that, just like Mary did. Maybe you know the name C.S. Lewis, author of many Christian apologetic works, also wrote that great series, The Chronicles of Narnia, right, about a fantastic land called Narnia and the lion Aslan and the Pevensey children. Well, he wasn't always a Christian, In fact, for a good chunk of his adult life, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He did not want to believe in God, and he especially didn't want to believe in the Christian God. And you want to know why? He wrote these words. I had always wanted, above all things, not to be interfered with. And the Christian God is like the cosmic interferer. He wants to come into our lives. But I had wanted, mad wish though it was, to call my soul my own soul. Right? My life is my life. My plans are my plans. And I don't want God to interfere with it, but God interferes. God's not far away. God wants to be in your life. He wants to be in my life. He wants to be in our lives. Can we say yes to that? The amazing thing about Mary is that when she was confronted with the opportunity to have Christ in her life, to define her life, she said, yes. She became present and available to God. Here I am, the servant of the Lord, she said. That's a present tense thing. Here I am. Whatever I was imagining for the future, I am now setting aside. Here I am for you. Years and years ago, when I took original languages class, one of them was Hebrew, and this is, text is kind of related to this idea of her saying, you know, here I am. Hineni in the original language. 
Here I am. Why do I remember that? It's a small little word because it always happens in the Bible. You go back to Genesis, the angel calls Abraham. He says, here I am, present, paying attention, available to you. What are you going to say? When Moses was at the burning bush, the Lord said, Moses, Moses. Moses turned and said, here I am. When Eli called young Samuel, the would-be prophet, Samuel ran into the room and said, here I am. Here I am. I'm, I am present. I am paying attention. I'm here. I am the servant of the Lord. I am ready for whatever it is that you want to communicate to me, ask of me, or turn me into. For Mary, that meant this is my body, but it's not just my body. It is also the body that I subserviate to you, Lord. It is my heart, but not just my heart. I also give you my heart. I have my plans, but they are not meant to be mine. Apart from you, I give you my plans. I am here. I am your servant. Let it be done to me according to your will, present and available. And so the angel leaves. Gabriel exists to do the will of God. Mary has made the same choice. There's nothing else to say. He goes about his mission. Mary now has hers. And her mission, her identity, her life now is in orbit around Jesus. And she has the closest relationship with Jesus all throughout the Gospels. And we see how she enriched Jesus, bringing him up to be Messiah, and how then as Messiah and as Christ he then taught her about the kingdom of God. Jesus appeared and said, I am the son of God. Where did he learn that truth first, I wonder? Probably Mother Mary sitting him down and saying, well, let me, son, let me tell you a little something. You were born of the spirit of God and someday you're gonna hear a voice that's gonna say, you are my son and I am well pleased with you. When that happens, don't be alarmed. That is your heavenly father. You are the son of God. Jesus went into the countryside saying, I have come to bring healing and forgiveness. And he knew that because his mother named him Jesus, which means Savior. When his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. One of the stanzas he taught his disciples was, say this, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe Mother Mary taught him that too. Let it be done to me according to your will. Heavenly Father. When he stood before Pilate, Pilate said, are you a king? And Jesus says, I am a king, though not of this world. The king of heaven, the king of the eternal throne. And when he hung on the cross, he said, not my will. You know, he said, I entrust my, myself to you. In your hands, Heavenly Father, I commit my spirit. Isn't that what Mary did on that very first evening when the angel visited her? visited her, I entrust myself to you. Here I am. And she saw the fruit of those seeds planted in the Annunciation throughout Jesus's life. And when he rose from the dead, she knew then, then more than any time up to that point, just how true the angel's words were, you are blessed because you get to know Jesus. And we get to know Jesus. Mary is meant to be a role model for us to say yes to God. There's not an appropriate time for us to say no to God. God always says yes to us. We want to always say yes to him. God wants to give us Jesus, his Christ, his kingdom. And we, wherever we are in life, want to say, here I am for you, God, and I am your servant, and I want Jesus to be in the center. I want to be present and available to him. And that is so critical because we spend so much of our lives living in this future that hasn't happened, that we can't control. When the present moment is full of Jesus,
We don't know what tomorrow holds. But we can know right now the one who holds tomorrow. And the more we hold to him, the more we can look back on our life and say, he is the Christ, the Son of God. He was all the time. And I'm so blessed to have shaped my life around him. Now, another side note. If right now your plans in life aren't working out and everything is derailed, and you might think to yourself, oh, how hard and how terrible this is for me. But sometimes when our plans aren't working out, we are even more able to say, Lord, I want your plan in my life. And if your life is squared away and right now everything is just trucking along right according to plan, then pray to God for the grace that Mary had in the midst of plans that seem so firm to say, yet God, I want you to visit me and give me your son because that's what I need in the depths of my heart. I mentioned C.S. Lewis earlier. He had many plans, and a lot of those plans continued to unfold. He was a great academician. He was a great writer, but he also took ups and downs, and one of his deep downs was the death of his wife from cancer. But what he gained in Christ was a vision of a hope that could never be taken away. He knew that he was destined not for this world and all of its plans, but for the kingdom of heaven, and he wrote so beautifully about that. In the very last book of his Narnia series called um, The Last Battle, there's this scene where all the heroes are coming in. They finally get to see Aslan the lion's country. Uh, it's an image of the kingdom of God. And among them is a unicorn. It's a fantastic creature. And he's standing on the frontiers of Aslan's country and he's stamping his feet. He can't wait to charge in. And he says these words, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come, come, friends, come further up, come further in. Let us go into this new country. And all throughout that book, the last battle, the refrain is come in, come further up, come further in. Christmas is our opportunity to come, come to Jesus and receive him. You're a child of the kingdom. I'm a child of the kingdom. And Christmas is our God, our Father, coming and saying, I give you this gift. Let's not turn away. Let's turn to. Let's say yes. Let's pray. Lord, our God, we thank you for the Christmas message that you have blessed us in Jesus. And we pray that you would give us the grace that you gave Mary to hear the good news that you want to be central in our lives as Son of God, as Savior, and as King. Help us to say yes to that and receive that great blessing. Amen.